I have the pleasure today of being with Dr. Neil Barnard, who is the f president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He founded the Barnard Medical Center in Washington, D.C., and is quite a prolific author. And wow, thank you ta for taking the time today. I'm delighted to be with you again. And we're going to continue talking about this book because this has just blown me away, The Cheese Trap. So let's dig in. The University of yeah. Michigan asked a question. Which foods do you find most addictive? Share the results of that study. Yes, they surveyed 384 people and what you said is what they did, is which foods give you trouble, meaning you're eating it and you just can't stop. You intended to have just one piece, but you ended up having 16 or whatever. So what were those foods? Well, uh, kind of predictably ice cream mm. is on the list. Cookies, you know, we've all been there. You were going to have one, but you end up having the whole bag. Chips, um, chocolate was number two, but number one was actually pizza. Oh, and shocker. Yes, yes, and I'm going to say it's not the sun-dried tomatoes. It's not the olives. It's not the crust. None of that. It's that three quarters of an inch of yellow asphalt that's dribbling all over the edges of the pizza and down your fingers and into your lap and into your coronary arteries and <laughs> everywhere else. You no, know, pizza, it's really surprising. Pizza was something that wasn't really such a big deal before, but now it has become an everyday food and the cheese layer was small. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's a delivery vehicle for, for cheese. It, well, and they're stuffing it now into the crusts and yeah. everything else, every other which way they can get it in there. So, yeah. Now, now, part of that is by design. You know, the government actually has programs to try to load cheese into foods. And this is a way of promoting American agriculture. So they find ever creative ways of putting more cheese in. And you think, wait a minute, there's already cheese on top of the crust. Does there have to actually be cheese embedded in the crust? And apparently the answer is yes, in the same way as it has to be embedded in your coronary arteries. So, well, was there uh, like a marketing campaign for this just to increase the amount of cheese? Well, there have been a number of marketing campaigns that the U.S. government has done over time. They've worked with all the major fast food chains on contract to say, okay, how are we going to get you to be promoting more cheese? And, and you know, the idea is to benefit American agriculture. And in fact, by to their in their defense, the U.S. government has to promote American agriculture. The unfortunate thing is they're not promoting lettuce and carrots and broccoli and Brussels sprouts and, and oranges and apples and things that would actually be healthy, but they promote dairy products, particularly cheese. And so, yes, the government has signed contracts with Wendy's and with uh, Burger King and Taco Bell and the other major fast food chains to push cheese products in their stores and to try out new products new sandwiches and things like that, that, that include cheese as a featured ingredient. Mm. I know we talked a little bit about salt in our previous videos, but is there a lot of salt in pizza? Yes. And in cheese in general, and it's, it's used partly for taste, but it's also it part of the cheese making process because as we talked about it before, you use bacteria to ferment the lactose sugar and to an extent they modify the proteins and they would create that musty, cheesy smell. But if it goes on too far, it could be too much. And so at the end of the cheese baking process, they add a lot of salt and that kind of, it has a sort of a bacteriostatic action to just say, okay, this is what we want and we're gonna stop at this point. Problem is, it's a lot of salt. Salt, you know, is, affects your blood pressure, it affects your body weight by holding water weight. But the amount of salt well, for comparison, two ounces of potato chips, 330 milligrams of salt, sodium. Two ounces of cheddar, 350. Two ounces of Edom, 500. Two ounces of Velveeta, 800 milligrams. Uh, yeah, exactly. The whole 800 milligrams of sodium. And, and so it's, you don't tend to think of cheese as being so salty because it has other flavors that kind of, kind of hide it. But it is. It's, when people go on a low sodium diet, that is one of the first places that they really have to look. Well, do you remember off the top of your head, like, like if I got a slice of pizza, how, what are we talking here? Well, every, let's say you had uh, a couple ounces of, uh, if I had say two ounces of cheese, that would be the amount that might go on say one slice. 
and two ounces of, of cheese has about 350 uh, milligrams of sodium. So let's say you had a couple of slices, maybe three slices, you're over a thousand um, right there. Wow. And, yeah. And, and if it's a deep dish pizza, I mean, it can be much, much higher <laughs> than that. And it depends on the type that they use. But yeah, yeah you see, it's the case with pretty much all of the, all of the cheese. Oh my gosh. I mean, that would, because I'm pretty much, I'm very, very salt sensitive. So that would like kill me. I mean, if I were to eat that now. Oh, you are, you are not alone. I mean, there's so many people where just for good health or for high blood pressure or for water weight or heart failure, all kinds of reasons. There are many reasons why people are on, put on lower sodium diets. And, and I guess there's another just kind of real simple reason. And that is we normally will eat a certain amount of food and then we stop. But if I put extra sugar, extra salt, other things, I can lead you into having more of my food than you'd have otherwise. So you're eating because we, we gravitate towards salt. And in fact, people, we've talked before about dopamine. People have done brain scans showing that salt, when you have a fair amount of it, it's not just tickling the taste buds, it actually does trigger a little dopamine release too. Well, is salt then an appetite stimulant? It is. I think it's, you know, the old Lay's potato chips, but you can't eat just one. Mm -hmm. um, if, yeah. if, they, if they gave you one taste of mashed potato, you might say, okay, I've had my one. Thanks. But when it's potato chips. Oh, I could eat the bag. You, you can't eat just one. That's right. And, and it's, not just, it's not just the salty part. I think it's the salty, greasy combination because it's like French fries or potato chips, onion rings. The, something about the saltiness and the greasiness together. I, I, I know I'm not making it sound appetizing, but that's what really does hook people. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, but why? Why is it that, that it's so addicting, that salt, cheesy, the oily, greasy yeah. combo? Yeah. Yes. And don't forget the casomorphins, which are the, <laughs> the opiate part that adds to the mix. All of the addictive substances that we know of, heroin, morphine, and, and things that are more innocuous, like a cup of coffee or alcohol or tobacco, all, all of these things that have addictive potential, they all affect dopamine in the brain, dopamine, the, the pleasure chemical. And food can do that too. And I don't mean asparagus or artichokes or apples. I mean, they, they will trigger a tiny little dopamine. Why? <laughs> Why are those <laughs> triggering it? Come on. Well, well they, in nature, that's all there would be. But people figured out quite a long, many centuries ago, that if I take grapes, and I don't just give you a grape, but I ferment the grape juice, and I let the alcohol form, now we're on to something. And now I can make it addictive. Or somebody lit up uh, tobacco at some point in time immemorial. And if it had been some other leaf, and I'm sure people tried all kinds of things, nothing would have happened. But tobacco triggers dopamine uh, release and you turn poppies into heroin or uh, the coca leaves into cocaine. And people have, have experimented with things. These happen to be the ones that stimulate uh, dopamine release and that's true for cheese. Wow. It's true for salt. And so if it didn't do that, you wouldn't get addicted to it. And the ones that, that it does, you get addicted. And, and, and by the way, history is not stopping. Uh, manufacturers are looking for ways to keep you more addicted. So they have, you know, the candy manufacturers, they have uh, whole teams of scientists figuring out what is the perfect combination of cocoa butter and the sugar. The point. And the, exactly. And so, you know, it's true that the chip manufacturers are saying, what if we put a little bit of salt, a little bit of MSG, a little bit of a, a, a cheese flavoring, and what will just make you not be able to resist? This is what they do all the time. This is how they make their money. Oh wow! Depressing, isn't it? But this is the world we live. <laughs> this is the world we live in. But it's hard. It's hard to, to fight against this. It really is, especially when it's on every corner. You can't go a block, or you're walking in a building. There's a vending machine that's got. Stuff yes, in it. yes. These are this is the food industry is trying to pick you up by the ankles and shake the change out of your pockets, and they want to take it. And in exchange, they are going to give you something that is not good for you. Oh, um, so true. Back when when we were kids. There weren't so many convenience stores and fast food things, and, and food was food. Nowadays, food is a drug, and it's like being a person who wants to quit smoking, but every single person is just handing you a cigarette tray. 
Um, that's the life we live in. And who is especially at risk are kids because this is the only thing they've ever known. They, they really haven't had rules to help them. Let's talk about casein because I think a lot of people don't understand what casein is right. and what impact that it has on our body. Yeah, casein is a protein and all proteins, whether it comes from meat or from broccoli or from soy milk or, or anything, all proteins. If you could look at them under a powerful microscope, they are a string of beads and each bead is an amino acid. It's a protein building block. And so you have one and another and another and another and another, and they're all just hooked together to make the protein molecule. So you eat it and the beads break apart and they go into your bloodstream, the amino acids. And there your body can say, great, I can use these to make my own proteins. And that's the way protein works. Now casein is the main milk protein. And the thing about it is though, that although it is a string of amino acids, when you eat it, it doesn't entirely break apart. Some of the strings, three, four, five, six, seven, eight beads in length, amino acids, stay together. And they retain a particular chemical property, which is to attach to the receptors in the brain for, uh, that narcotics attach to. And so they stimulate those receptors a little bit, and that gives you that, ah, that cheese was great feeling. That's what it comes from. It, it come, and and ke- there's casein in milk, but it's concentrated when you turn milk into cheese. And so well, she- is there a relationship between casein and cancer? This is really what we've been hearing from, uh, particularly from Colin Campbell, who wrote the China study. And he said, has said really remarkable things that casein, you, know, you think of fat, like the fat in milk, that's going to be the problem. And he says, wait, wait, it's the protein. And he may be onto something because researchers at Harvard looked at milk consumption and found that milk was fairly strongly linked to prostate cancer, which international studies show show as well. And Harvard did uh, one study of 21,000 physicians found that milk was linked to prostate cancer. They did another study about 48,000 participants. And once again, they found the same thing. The men who had the most milk or dairy products had about a 60% higher risk of prostate cancer, which is not good. Uh, But the, the, the amazing thing, was that these men were health conscious people. They were uh, doctors in the first case and other health professionals in the second case. And so they weren't eating a lot of fatty uh, stuff for the most part. The milk they drank was non-fat milk. But researchers have suggested, wait a minute, there's no fat in there. But what's left? It's the casein protein and also the lactose sugar. And so their concern is that in the same way that milk causes a baby, a calf to grow. Maybe in your blood, it causes your cells to grow or a cancer cell that might be there is more likely to grow. So milk is for babies and it should be mom's milk for a baby, human milk for a human baby, cow's milk for cow babies, and nobody gets milk after the age of weaning. Wow. Yeah. We need to hear that more. Yeah, it's very important. You call cheese the equivalent of dairy crack. Right. (laughs) Would you explain (laughs) that analogy? Yeah. I take, if you take milk, milk has the casein in it and that casein breaks down to release the casomorphins that go to the brain and presumably calm the baby, the the nursing calf or a nursing baby. And so we, we presume that's the casomorphins natural function. But when I turn milk into cheese, what am I doing? I'm getting rid of the watery whey. The, the whey is the watery mixture that's there. And I'm concentrating the fat, I'm concentrating the cholesterol, but I'm also concentrating the protein. So you're getting the most concentrated source of casein in any product, and you're getting the biggest casomorphin hit you could get. So I sometimes call it dairy crack, which is why a person might say, I like, I love ice cream. Um, I like milk, I like yogurt, I like all that stuff, but cheese. It's in a class, mm. it's in a class by itself um, because it has more of the casomorphins than the other dairy products do. It, it does. Well, speaking of drugs, share with me, share with us this story about the drug sniffing dogs at the Manchester airport. This now, is hilarious. Yeah, this is, you know, Manchester is a port of entry for, and it's a big, big uh, airport in Northern England. A lot of tourists will come through there. A lot of people from other countries come through there. 
a lot of workers and various products uh, projects come through there. And so the Manchester police said, this is a port of entry. We can have all kinds of drugs coming through. So they, they built kennels. They put dogs in all the kennels and they trained them up to be able to sniff out drugs. And what they discovered was that the dogs did a terrible job. They weren't finding drugs at all. And it turned out that what they were distracted by was all the British tourists going down to France or going to Switzerland or whatever and picking up sausage and cheese and bringing it through in their luggage. And the dogs just couldn't, um, couldn't get it out of their heads. That's what they kept sniffing out. So, so, yeah, so anyway, the Manchester River had a terrible failure with their dog, drug sticking dogs. So the dogs. dogs were just as addicted. I guess. And you know, it's true. And I don't recommend that anybody does this, but if you get, give a Velveeta sandwich to your dog, your dog will happily eat it. And the next day they'll ask you for more. And yes, they could get hooked on junk, bad foods, just like a person can. Wow. Well, anybody who's going <laughs> to smuggle drugs, don't put the cheese and the sausage in your suitcase. No, but apparently people can go into Manchester with a, with a suitcase full of cocaine because the dogs are too busy looking at the cheese. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In your book, you talked about breast milk and postpartum psychosis. Oh, my gosh. This was amazing. Yes. I, uh, share this. Wow. Yeah, yeah. This this was really astounding. Um, we were talking earlier about these casomorphins that affect the brain of the nursing baby. And, and just to be clear, the baby is nursing from mom. The milk goes into the stomach, and the proteins are broken apart, liberating the little casomorphins that get go to the baby's brain and cause this calming effect. Well, researchers in Scandinavia took an interest in women who had given birth, and as you know, fairly shortly after birth, uh, milk is produced. Right. And this is for the baby. But right around that same time is when you see this terrible condition called postpartum psychosis. Yeah. Now, I don't mean postpartum depression right. uh, or just the blues. Uh, for all women, when, you, when you've given birth, let's face it, you've been through something a lot. Mm. A lot and it's, and yeah. it's also emotionally laden no matter what. And then postpartum depression occurs where you really get down in the dumps and so forth. Postpartum psychosis is more severe. This is where you could be hallucinating, you're delusional, um, you have lost touch with reality, and it's right. maybe one in a thousand women or less. Very, it's uncommon. But these researchers did spinal taps on women who had postpartum psychosis. They analyzed their spinal fluid, the fluid that's bathing the brain, and they found casomorphins in their spinal fluid. They thought, what is this? It turned out that as they were making breast milk, their own milk was leaking into their blood, breaking down to release huge amounts of casomorphin that went to their brain and poisoned them effectively. Wow. And this was, first of all, it was an amazing way to get an answer to a very disturbing disease that this could actually be just this, what would you call it? this un unintended result of a biological process where she's making milk, it's supposed to be for her baby, but it ends up poisoning her. But the other thing is it answered a question that had been on people's minds for a long time, which is, will these actually go to the brain? Because some people have said, wait a minute, the casomorphin molecules are too big. The blood-brain barrier will never allow them through. And what these researchers found out was the blood-brain barrier is basically no barrier at all for the casomorphins. It's, they, they go straight through it. So the, 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 the woman has the casomorphins in her blood. Right. I mean, they shouldn't, they shouldn't be there, but they are there. Right. And they go straight through the, the blood brain barrier. It just doesn't stop it. And the, uh, the blood brain so-called barrier is there's certain things that go right through it. Sugar goes straight through it. Alcohol goes straight through it. Some big molecules don't, but the casomorphins either pass through, they just diffuse through, or they could be actively transported. There are certain things that the brain says, I want that. And it calls downstairs and says, you find any of that? Set it up here. Uh, I don't know if that's what's going on with the case of morphins, but, but it acts like that. It's, it's no barrier whatsoever. Because isn't that a rather large molecule? It, yeah, it is. It is it, exactly. It's a large molecule. And you would think that the brain, the brain would, would, or you, you'll, you'd also think, wait a minute, it shouldn't go through my digestive tract. You know, why? the digestive tract is selective too. Think about this. For, for this to affect the brain, the casomorphins form in the digestive tract. They've got to get through the intestinal wall into the blood and right. through the blood-brain barrier into the brain. And you know what? They sail right through. They sail right through. So yes, people have speculated it couldn't possibly be, but it is true. They, they, they do 
they, they do it. And don't get me wrong, it's not enough of a narcotic effect to get you arrested, but it is just enough. It is just enough for yeah. people to get to, to people get hooked on this. And the problem is you're hooked on something that's high in cholesterol, high in salt, really high in saturated fat, and it raises your cholesterol. It's got so much in the way of calories, and it makes it and it defeats our appetite. So our appetite control. So we're gonna end up eating more and eating more and eating more and eating more, and it becomes as destructive over the long run as an illegal drug. Wait a minute, how can you say that? What I'm gonna say is anything that causes you to gain a lot of weight, anything that causes you to get diabetes or a high cholesterol level or atherosclerosis, over the short run, pretty innocuous. Uh, over the long run, it really can hurt you. And so that's why I suggest, as strange as this may be to say, that if kids never tasted that cheese on their pizza and it just wasn't part of their culture and they never got hooked on this stuff maybe better off well would there be a relationship between like say postpartum depression i mean i know there's you know there's a variety of hormones that are racing around the system no. and but could there be a relationship for that too like you're changing after you give birth i mean just levels of casomorphine that perhaps from the diet too it's an interesting speculation. We don't know the answer to it, um, but the, the the really severe cases where it's postpartum psychosis, right. some, pe some people might say, well, isn't it a spectrum from you're just, you got the blues, you're sleep deprived to being fairly severely fairly depressed to really being psychotic. That's a possibility. The other possibility is that these are really quite distinct conditions and that the depression is from all the hormone changes that you've gone through. Plus, I mean, let's face it, your responsibilities go way, way up and your sleep goes way, way down. And, yeah. and sometimes there are partner issues or family issues. We, in what should be a joyful time can be a difficult time for some people. Right. And yeah, uh, I am going, I'm not sure about this, but I'm going to speculate that postpartum psychosis is a different condition and that it is, I mean, you're just being poisoned uh, by something. I, I think that's really what, what's happening. Well, thank stay you. tuned. We'll stay tuned. We'll be smarter in the future than we are today. But the, but the amazing thing right now is to think that postpartum psychosis, at least in some cases, many cases, in fact, in these studies, uh, appears to be uh, an effect of auto poisoning caused by case well, Is there a way to stop that to, to no, block them? Nobody knows. No, nobody knows who is at risk and who isn't at risk. On the other hand, once it is formed, once it's happened, what it suggests is that maybe the treatment should be different. Because right now we use antipsychotic drugs which block this dopamine rush. You, what, what psychosis is, is dopamine and other neurochemicals just go completely haywire. But we have drugs that stop narcotic action. It's called Narcan. And there, there are others as well. So maybe you treat the psychosis with, not with, with a, a dopamine antagonist, but you treat it with a narcotic antagonist. Wow. Yeah. And has that been done at all or is that just- I do not theory? know. I do not know, but it's it's first thing I would do because it's, it's, it's totally innocuous treatment. I mean, you can give the same treatment to a chocolate addict. You can give it to a cheese addict. And not that you would need to do this, but if you knock out the dopamine effect, then the food loses a lot of its uh, addictive potential. Well, speaking of being a cheese addict, I mean, it, it, I'm plant-based, been for a while. It's not in my house. It's not in my cart. When we go out, rare, we don't go out much. We pretty much cook at home and carry our food with us. Or we might go out and have pizza. Okay, fine. I'm okay with not having cheese on the pizza. I'm okay with that. But put me in a social situation. And if there is some, not all cheese, but like say a brie that's been heated up and it's melty and gooey, all bets are off. I mean, should I like stand up and go, hi, I'm Jean, I'm a cheese addict? <laughs> Why? <laughs> yes, you should, but you know what? Everyone else is going to put up their hand too. You are, you are not alone. And, and what you described is, is really an important phenomenon because many people will say, well, all things in moderation just have a little bit when you're at a party. Uh, the problem is, let's say we're at a party and we think just this once and you indulge the next day your brain starts to think about what did I really enjoy yesterday? I think I want to do that again today. And so it's much harder to maintain your resolve if every now and then you reawaken all those memories. If you kind of let the memories fade away, you've got strength you don't, you don't otherwise have. And so at the risk of sounding 
like a kind of a toughie, I encourage people to just set aside things that are hurting them. I suggest them that they just set them aside completely. Because every time we go back to a cigarette, if I'm trying to quit smoking, it reminds me of how much I liked it. Mm. And it's just easier to forget about it. And, and that's true for food too. Well, in doing these videos, I have collected quite a few comments, some of them pretty amazing. But I think the number one comment that I have heard that people want to know and have asked me to ask you is because cheese is so much harder to break away from anything else in terms yeah, of the food, word, food world. What <laughs> suggestions can you give us to break this addiction? Because that has been like the number one question that I've been asked to ask you. Okay, excellent question. This is my favorite question. And I suggest that people do a couple of different things. The first is you can take a little time before you break up your love affair with cheese by just experimenting with some of the replacements for it. Of course, there are vegan cheeses, and I think of them as cheese methadone. In other words, there's no hormones yeah. in them. There's no, there's no cholesterol in them. Yeah. They're, so they're, he they're healthier, and the quality of fat is, is typically better, but they're not really low fat, and so they're not low calories. They may not be low sodium either, but it will help you. So there are brands like Treeline or Kite Hill or Yoko's, and, and there are many others. And you can, you can try them and see what you think. By the way, Miyoko, I don't know if you've seen this cheese. It's Miyoko's, Miyoko's Kitchen. Right. Uh, she's, in, she's in San Francisco. These cheeses are a work of art. She starts with cashews and she'll wrap it up in black Mediterranean pine ash. Or she'll wrap it in a fig leaf. And so you bring it to a party and it's the most beautiful gift. And what Miyoko will say is, wait a minute, this is not a food group. Don't like shovel it in your mouth. Nibble, nibble, tiny bits. So, so that's, that's cool. So anyway, you can use those if you wish to. If it's a salad, instead of feta on your salad, put avocado, similar mouthfeel, no cholesterol, no hormones, better fat in it. If you're making a pizza, put extra sauce and put, make the pizza good. Some caramelized onions on there and put all the artichoke carts and things. But sprinkle in a little nutritional yeast. And if you've never used nutritional yeast, it's at the health food store. It's for some reason they put it in the supplement aisle because bodybuilders get these cans of it. It doesn't have any fat, high in protein, but you're not using it to be a bodybuilder. You're just using it because through some weird uh, coincidence, it tastes like cheese. So you put the new, and by the way, it's not brewer's yeast. It's not baker's yeast. It's nutritional yeast. It's bright yellow. Sprinkle it on your pizza. And it's not exactly cheese, but it does lend some of that cheesy flavor. Kids love it. They put in all kinds of stuff. Popcorn. Yeah, popcorn. Exactly. Um, and then what you also discover is when you're ready, just say no to cheese. Be strict with yourself. Don't have any at all for three weeks, but you can have all the nutritional yeast flavor and pizzas and things that you want. And at the end of that time, First of all, you're starting to like it less, but you may even find yourself being repulsed by it. And I, for a person who adores cheese, you're gonna think, how could that possibly be? It's in the same way as smokers love smoking. After they've quit for about two months, they say, could you not be near me when you're smoking? They don't want that smell anymore. And I know it sounds funny to say this will happen to you with cheese, but it will. You'll start to look at it. And particularly when people think about the environment or the animal effects or the animal issues and whatever, they start thinking, that's just creepy. They don't want it anymore. But, but for, for a person who is actively in their cheese addiction phase, they'll think it's, how could I even uh, dislike this cheese? They, they won't believe that it's true, but it will happen. So try really? the cheese. Really? Yeah. Oh, yes. Really? Okay. Yeah. All right. Because yes. yes, my inner raccoon will. still comes out. I mean, even though like I know how it's made now, thank you very much, Neil. I appreciate that. <laughs> wow. Just trying to cheer you up. Yeah. I know how it's made. I know it's disgusting. All the issues. Yeah, but my inner raccoon still comes out every once in a while, uh, and it's just... I, I understand. Every, everybody's different. You know, everybody has their own, their own vulnerabilities. But as time goes on, you find that that, it, that just goes away. And also, the other thing, as you notice, you know, when you're slimming down and you're feeling better, more energy, um, you think, hmm, I'm going to stick with this, you know? So... There is that. You, you just get more and more and more momentum. And, and this, this, this continues. It gets better and better and better. So you'll see. All right. I'm looking forward to that day. And I'm sure all, everybody else out there is going, oh, yeah, me too. I'm looking forward to that day.
In the meantime, call me up if you're on on the edge of just having to have it. I will, I, Gene, I will talk, You'll talk you. me down. I will talk it down. All right. I'm here. I'm here I'm for gonna, you. I'm holding you to that. Just, whoa. I'm going to talk you down. I'm at a party. Help me. I know. Don't I know it? Don't I know it? Well, thank you so much. As always, you've shared the the you've shared such amazing knowledge with us. Thank you. Well, it's an unusual topic, but it's one that touches on so many parts of life and parts of health. And thank you for spreading the word.